Merci d'être là aujourd'hui. It's my very great pleasure today <coughs> to introduce um, Paul Wells and CJ Chivers, who will have a conversation about Mr. Chivers' reporting over the last, uh, I guess, 15 to more than 15 years with the New York Times um, and covering what I call the post 9 11 wars. Um, <coughs> Paul will properly introduce. C.J. Chivers, maybe I'll just very quickly say that we're thrilled that Paul Wells has come to, <clears throat> to conduct this conversation. Uh, he'll be well known to most of you as one of Canada's preeminent political commentators. And of course, most recently, uh, he did a fabulous job uh, at one of the leaders' debates in our last election campaign. So thank you, Paul, for being here, and I'll turn it over to you. There will be time at the end for some questions from the audience. And I would just ask that if you have questions, you have to put them from that mic there. CPAC is filming, and otherwise it won't pick up your question. And uh, please be brief, and please do pose a question. Thank you. Thank you, David. Uh, thanks to everyone for coming out, and thanks to the legions who are watching at home or at their desk over lunch. Uh, I'm Paul Wells, I write for McLean's Magazine, and uh, it is a pleasure to uh, have already met briefly and had a coffee with Chris Chivers, uh, and uh, now to sort of um, let him do most of the talking over the next hour. Uh, C.J. Chivers is a senior writer for the New York Times, as almost everyone here will know, and he has specialized in covering conflict, uh, politics, crime, and human rights, basically anywhere where the big story has been happening in the last uh, crazy decade and a half. Syria, Libya, Afghanistan, Iraq, Russia, where for a time he was the Moscow bureau chief for the Times, Georgia, um, Palestine, Chechnya, and on and on. Uh, he began at the Times in 1991 as a Metro reporter and uh, covered crime and law enforcement in New York City. And he kind of happened to be in the neighborhood uh, of Lower Manhattan on uh, September 11th, 2001. And uh, as you can imagine, has some interesting stories about what happened in the days following. Um, uh, before that, uh, in the, starting in 1988 and until 1994, he was uh, an infantry officer in the United States Marine Corps. Uh, he was honorably discharged uh, with the rank of captain in 1994. While he was in the Marines, he served in the first Persian Gulf War and uh, helped uh, maintain order or try to reestablish order or find it during the Los Angeles riots. Uh, and he is the author, most notably, of The Gun, which is a kind of a social history of the Kalashnikov rifle um, and uh, he's here now and our remit today Chris is to talk about uh, covering the new wars um, Let's kind of split that roughly in half, covering and the new wars. I'm, I'm always amazed when anyone uh, goes into journalism, but especially somebody who was already gainfully employed. And I'm, wonder yeah. I'm, wondering, I'm wondering how a good, honest Marine becomes a newspaper reporter. Well, I won't say it was by accident. I, uh, I had almost seven years in when I left the Marine Corps, but I like to think of it as a long four. And by that, I mean when you sign up for the Marine Corps, most people sign up for four years. I had intended to do four years. At the four-year mark, I was having a pretty good time and thought I would do another tour, but never really seriously entertaining a career, knowing I would have to find something else to do. At the six-year mark, I was having a really lousy time, uh, and it was clear to me that I, I needed to get out. And I had wanted to write whatever that meant in college. I didn't know what it meant. I didn't know that I didn't know anything. Uh, and so it wasn't time to write. And so I moved to journalism to figure out how to write. Uh, I moved to journalism thinking that working for a newspaper was probably a lot like being in the infantry. You have to do the same things often rep repeatedly and well. Um, and so it seemed to me to be a good apprenticeship in writing. I didn't know I was going to like it. I quickly found out that journalism, for journalism's sake, and the public service aspect of journalism, and the daily puzzle of trying to solve anything from a rollover on Route 95 to a stray piece of ordinance laying on the ground on the other side of the world, the puzzle's always fascinating. And that's why I've done it more than seven years. Uh, which was really my expiry time in the Marine Corps. Okay. Um, 
we'll get to the stuff that everyone came to talk about, but I'm, I'm, I'm a little fascinated by those few years that you spent as a city hall reporter for the daily newspaper in Providence. Mm -hmm. uh, did you think at the time that that was pretty much what you were settled into journalism to do, or were you looking around for other possibilities? That was really fun. Uh, I didn't know what I was going to do. It was still pretty early in my career, but I was covering an extraordinarily corrupt, unbelievably colorful character, and it was something like imagine covering the penguin, you know. And 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 he was teaching me a lot. The paper had very strict rules, like we could never quote anyone off record. So there was all of these things that you would uncover or discover. You would be told that were very hard to get into the paper. And going up against that every day, trying to build the story or f build the bigger stories um, was, you know, a challenge I was enjoying. And I wasn't counting on doing this. I was recruited to do this. I, I had in the back of my mind that eventually I'll probably find my way to war correspondence because of my background. But in the 90s, there wasn't, the world wasn't as it is now. And I didn't really feel ready. I was trying to figure out this new profession. And I got into this job because I was recruited for it, not because I had a, a master plan to end up here. OK. So the New York Times comes to get you? I met some Times editors at a function. And uh, one of them said, the next time you're in New York, you know, come in for a visit. And I didn't think I was ready. And frankly, what happened was I had a bad day at work. Uh, and a really bad day, and I decided uh, maybe I'm ready for a visit to New York. And so I went down to see a play, and I wrote a note that I'd be in town to see a play in New York, and things happened from there. Okay. Um, now, you spent two years on the City Hall beat at, uh, at the Times. Is on the police beat. Police beat. The police beat, which okay. actually, under Giuliani, they were kind of the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> And then, so what were you doing on, on the morning of September 11th? I had been uh, gathered, as would happen on primary day, uh, and will always happen on primary day in any city with a newspaper. I'd been gathered and pulled into the election coverage. Um, and so I was up early. I was wearing a suit. If I, can, I can hardly imagine that now. And had gone to the Board of Elections for poll opening. Uh, the Board of Elections had set up a call center for the polls that are scattered across this incredible geography of the city. And they knew that they would have polls, you know, voting booths that did not work, the machines that wouldn't function, or the janitor at PS 234 would forget the key, and there would be problems. And this I was. Is the, this is the primary elections uh, for the mayor of New York. Where each party was picking their candidate for the mayoralty. That's right. right. Okay. And so I'd been assigned to go. Uh, sit in on the call center and be prepared to just keep the paper informed. I, there must have been 50 or 100 of us doing similar things scattered across the city. Um, that building happened to be just a couple of blocks from the World Trade Center. Okay, so you heard the news before you heard what the news was about. I, guess, right? uh, I didn't hear the plane strike. Yeah. I didn't hear, I mean, the first plane came out of the north and I was a little to the south. Um, and I was in an old, thick stone building. Uh, and my pager went off. Remember, we all had pagers then. And, uh, and it was a friend of mine who was just north, of the, uh, just north of the World Trade Center. And the first plane had flown right over his head. He was having breakfast outside with a source, I think a prosecutor or a judge. And he was one of my reporting partners. And he uh, had seen the plane go overhead and hit the World Trade Center. And he was kind of like, you know, get on your feet. We're working. Okay. You spent the next how many weeks on that site? 12 days, so about 12 two days. weeks. Yeah. yeah. Doing what? I mean, uh, uh, at first, you weren't actually reporting as such. Uh, well, in the first minutes, uh, and maybe the reason I lived, was I, uh, I ran out of the, the call center we were in, which was on, I'm going to say, the sixth floor, the eighth floor, the fifth floor. It was you know, midway up through this building, and I started to run down the steps. Like, I pushed the elevator, and it was like a bad movie, and I'm standing there, like, <laughs> waiting for the elevator, and I was like, this isn't working. So I started to run down the stairs, and I made it a flight or two, and I realized I don't have my Palm Pilot. And in the Palm Pilot, I had loaded the phone numbers for every hospital and, and hospital spokesperson and emergency room in the city, and we knew these would be 
busy spots. And as a police reporter, I knew that I might, however this develops, end up covering, having to cover this. So I need my Palm Pilot to do this job. So I turn around and I ran back into uh, uh, the call center, grabbed my bag, which is just like the one on the corner, it's just a little bag, and, and, and ran back down the stairs. And that delay probably was two minutes or three is why I didn't reach the second building. I was trying, my idea was to get into the second building, World Trade Center 2, because I knew that security would be built around very quickly, and you wanted to be inside the cordon before the cordon went up so you could work. I assumed it was an accident. Uh, this is a highway for airplanes there. I assumed it was a Cessna-like plane. I hadn't seen any footage yet. I didn't know much. I thought, you know, some guy took a heart attack and lost control of his plane and bounced it off the skyscraper, which on the math is going to happen in New York, right? If you wait a century, someone's going to fly a plane into a building. Today's that day. Um, as I was running towards the second tower, um, I could see the degree of smoke didn't seem to be Cessna-sized, and things were falling off the tower, fluttering down, you know, and I was pulling them out of the air as we ran, like, I remember getting a Chinese menu that must have been in someone's desk, and a lot of that green, remember the green and white computer paper, the real broad stuff? Yeah. Yeah, and there was some of that, that probably someone's file cabinet had been, you know, knocked over, and that was spilling out. And I was starting to think that this is bigger than my first cut at it, when the second plane went right over my head into the, into the building. And had I been one or two minutes closer, uh, it might have been different for me. Now, you end up spending 12 days on the pile trying to, try and, first of all, trying to uh, ascertain whether there's any survivors who could be uh, rescued, doing um, uh, cleaning up rubble. At some point, you transition back to your job as a reporter. So the f I s overnighted, I stayed on the site until the next morning, uh, and then I hadn't slept. And I was kind of a mess. We were covered in this, I mean, we kind of looked like powdered donuts. And my ankles were bleeding because there was a lot of grit and they had gotten it. I was wearing wingtips and so were the shoes. The leather met the sock, met the skin that was all full of this grit. And I knew, you know, you, you can't work like this in wingtips and I need to sleep at some point. So I went home and slept until, I don't know, three, four, five in the afternoon. And uh, my boss called and asked if I thought I could get back in. And I went back down as a laborer. I put on a, a pair of jeans and I found an old Marine Corps sweatshirt in one of my drawers and uh, I just walked down through the cordons till I got on the pile. Uh, and you couldn't really work openly. I mean, in our, uh, in our free society, you know, journalism is sometimes prohibited. And in, this was one of those cases. Uh, they were not letting any press through. So I thought, but why can't I be a laborer? Why can't a journalist labor, right? Every other profession is allowed here. Why shouldn't mine be allowed? So the first thing I did is I went to sleep. I was still exhausted, and there was a pile of firefighters on the lobby of, a, I don't know, an office building, a bank building. Um, and I just saw them there, and I went and laid down among them and slept like, a, like we were a bunch of grunts again. And when I woke up, nobody asked me any questions, you know, a few hours later. And I just morphed into, I became, tried to find something that was useful, but also in which I could circulate for my job. So I found a garbage bin, and I just pushed the garbage bin around the pile for about a week, five days, six days. Just, and I'd go back and sleep in this spot, and then get up and push the garbage. And I made a mountain of garbage, I mean, bigger than this room. Uh, and everyone got used to me. Was, everyone had a pile of stink next to them. All the rescue workers and people, you know, they were handing out sandwiches. All this the infrastructure kind of developed in a, in, a, in a completely ad hoc fashion. And all the infrastructure was generating garbage and no one was picking it up except me. Uh, and after a while, I wrote a story uh, that made people angry and security, no I didn't, no. Security was tightening and they reached the point where in order to be in you were supposed to have a ID with a watermark. And they were handing these out and as more people around me had the ID I realized the math is getting bad, there'll be a shift change here and the incoming guy is going to bust me for doing what I thought was a good deed. I'm utterly unashamed about what we did. Um, and so I walked out on my own. 
And then I called a friend at the National Guard who I'd seen was down there, and I said, can I go in with the guard? And they said, sure. And so I spent another week living in a National Guard tent on the edge of the pile, and I was then finally thrown out, although it was a, it was a fake toss. I wrote a story about how the uh, police were looting. Um, I thought the story was bracing and good, and it was sort of a return to normal, right? When we start being bad again, <laughs> we're sort of recovering our sense of self. Uh, and uh, Giuliani didn't think the story was a good thing. And so they called the National Guard and demanded to know why they'd allowed a reporter in or something like I, I got a play of the conversation secondhand. So I don't know exactly what was said, except that it was intense and hostile. And so I called my friend back, and I said, Throw me out, man. Piss all over me. Do whatever you need to do. Just throw me out. Make a show. And they threw me out. And uh, I got back and I got some sleep and my boss said, you know, you're going to Central Asia now. Okay. <laughs> was, Moscow, was Moscow always sort of a, a staging ground for all these other theaters? or? Uh... I asked to go to Africa. How I ended up in Moscow, you'd have to ask my boss at the time. Uh, I like going places where there's not a lot of other reporters um, and not a lot of editing uh, and less... Most big city newsrooms are like that now. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you win. We should stop right there. Uh, no, I wanted to, uh, you know, there's a line I'd heard at some point which is, you know, the best way to work is to zag. Don't go with the crowd, and Africa seemed like a place where a zag would be more possible than getting trapped in what I call wire echo, you know, where everybody is seeing the same things on their computer screen each day. By everybody, I mean all of your peers, all of your peers' bosses, the larger community, and you get trapped into this lane of writing similarly, you know, and the public discourse can take a sameness. So I thought, I'll try to go to Africa. So I asked to go to Africa, and I ended up in Moscow. Uh, and I thought, you know, I, I actually didn't think they'd give me Moscow. I probably wouldn't have asked for it. I was pretty young. Um, and I pretty quickly realized Moscow is a pretty good hub airport. You can get all sorts of places from here. So it turned out to be a professionally very productive place to work. Okay. Let's, I mean, if we, if we go sort of a week at a time, we could be here for a while. So let's gloss over the next 15 years and try and yeah, te sure. te tease out some themes in your, in, in your journalism. There's a million ways to be a war correspondent. What, what, what did you figure you could bring to the craft, and what, um, uh, what techniques did you hone as, the, as that part of your career went on? So first thing to say is you're right. There's a million ways. And one is not better or more essential than the other. Uh, I had a, a background and a body of knowledge that had been stamped into my head in you know what I'll call the hatchery of the Marine Corps uh, that I could access and use journalistically. And I thought it would be valuable journalistically to focus on combatants and weapons and tactics and and doctrine writ small, how it plays out, how fighting happens and who combatants are and what effects they and their instruments of violence have upon the space around them. That's one way to cover war. It's not better than the others. In many ways, it's uh, wholly insufficient for understanding war. But I thought I could do that. And so that's what I have focused on. And I've sort of, for most of those years, was a floater. I would go to one war or another and support the staff that was already at the war and had, frankly, a richer political and social understanding of the area than I did and that I would not be able to match. Uh, I could cover this lane for them to complement the rich bodies of work they were doing. Um, so that was sort of my organizing idea. As I worked over the course of the 15 years, I also wanted to understand where all the tools of violence were coming from. How did they get there? So I very slowly, methodically, initially for myself and without declaring it, built a huge archive of everything I was seeing weapons-wise. So after um, a drive down a road, we'd come to a spot where some violence had been and there'd be cartridge cases all around the ground. I'd just scoop them up and fill a bag with them, throw them in the back of the car. 
And at night, I would inventory them one by one and tried to figure out where the cartridges were coming for. And I gradually expanded this out to ammunition crates, to bits of shrapnel, uh, to the fins on rockets, uh, to the seeker eye on a busted uh, heat-seeking missile that was, you know, laying out in a field. I gradually built this, and it was very strange. After a number of years, a pretty big number, more than five, I started to see the connection. Things started to make sense. And I had enough material that you start to see what wasn't there before. That's a big moment when something that's actually old is new. In other words, this type of ammunition has not been in this conflict for a number of years. It's here now. It's here in several places. How did it get here? And you try to walk that cat backwards to its source. And we talked about puzzles at the beginning, right? This became sort of, for me, the ultimate puzzle. And it pointed at times, usually not, but at times it pointed to an answer of how people were getting killed. And so I assume early on you're asking experts and, and former colleagues and stuff where this ordinance came from, but pretty early on you start to crowdsource it. You put a picture online or on a, on a blog and say... No, uh, there weren't other reporters to talk to about this. Everybody thought I was the eccentric. I, I, I was. Uh, so there wasn't a lot of people to talk with about this. It was mostly, I was just doing it, like I said, for me. Uh, to see where it would go. There were a few experts, but the experts often didn't have field data. Field data was lacking. At one point, only a few years ago, crowdsourcing became possible. I tried it a few times once to, well, it wasn't actually crowdsourced. I gave it to uh, a bomb disposal tech uh, who then put it on Facebook with his network, his larger network of bomb disposal techs and said, you know, free beer to whoever can figure this out. And they figured it out quickly, like in hours. Um, and it was a type of cluster munition that had never been used in combat before. So you couldn't Google it and find any images or references. Um, but they figured it out for me and I, I wrote about it. I then tried some more crowdsourcing and, found, and was pretty discouraged by it because there's a lot of people who deliberately were injecting false information into mm -hmm. the conversation. There was a lot of people who were seeking credit, not knowledge. Uh, and I haven't crowdsourced much since. A lot of people do it. They probably have a higher tolerance for the noise than I did. Uh, but I still do some of it. I tend to do it more quietly on closed networks. So help me understand why it's important to know where uh, a cartridge or a rocket comes from. A, a lot of um, distracted readers might just say, well, a war is a war, and they're going to get stuff, and they're going to use it. Like, wh why is this useful information? So let's say, here's, I'll give you a, a real-world example. There was an ambush in the Korangal Valley um, in eastern Afghanistan in, I get my years mixed up, I'm going to say 2009, I may be wrong, 2008, 2009, spring. And the American forces there killed several Taliban uh, fighters uh, in a very close pitched exchange of gunfire and carried home their equipment and put it in a big conic box, put a padlock on the conic box and more or less forgot about it. And I was there the next day. And, and I, at this point I was well into this project that, that I was personally pursuing and so I asked the company commander, do you mind if I have a peek in the conic box? And they unlocked it and there were a bunch of magazines, muddy and some of them bloody, and I took every round out and stuck them in the mud and took a picture of every one. As I was going through it, I started to see a type of ammunition that I knew had been introduced by the United States only within the past year. It had never existed in the Afghan conflict before, it was called, and that the United States had shipped in. And a significant proportion, I don't have my numbers with me now, I don't have the data, but you know, something like in the double digits of percentage uh, was coming from this source. These were American purchased, American supplied rifle cartridges that were in the country ostensibly for the Afghan security forces, had not been in the country very long, and were in the Taliban's magazine being fired back at the United States. So I thought this was a significant fact that tells us something about how ammunition moves through the country and how the equipment that you pass in to a country can very quickly be used against you. And it equipped me to ask, start asking, not on a hunch, but on a fact basis, fact-based basis, a lot of Afghans, 
What do you do with the ammunition that they give you, man? Like, you know, these Americans come by and they dump a lot of ammunition at your checkpoint or they leave it at your outpost and your commander distributes out. What do you do with your ammunition? And I started to get all these fascinating answers about how we sell it in the bazaar, you know? Because <laughs> we need money. They pay me X amount of dollars a month and if I sell the ammunition. And so it wasn't so much direct supply to the Taliban in the cases that I could identify. Now, and that's not that everyone telling you the truth. So that may have been direct supply to the Taliban as well. But you could demonstrate that for economic reasons, ammunition was changing hands and coming right back at the Americans who were supplying it. Okay. The other thing that you brought to your reporting was simply the knowledge of uh, military doctrine, uh, tactics, and strategy that uh, that a soldier learns. And I remember one uh, period during the Libya conflict in Misrata, you obtained some footage from uh, an independent videographer of some poor guy getting cut in the thigh and eventually dying. Yeah. And 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 the way you deployed that in the um, it was a, a, a rebel fighter. The way you deployed that was you first showed the. Uh, the raw video, which just looks chaotic. There's there's smoke, there's a bang, and then there's a guy who's hurt, and eventually he passes away. And then you showed you you you, you do a sort of a play-by-play. -play. Well, this gun is far too close to its target. That it shouldn't be fired anywhere near that close. Uh, Recoilless rifle with a hash round. Yeah, I remember it. Yeah, and then the blowback from the from the impact is 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 what what was what ends up killing the guy. It's not the other. It's not the, the, the regime soldiers firing at him. And then you show the holes in the wall of the compound that he's taken to, which show a certain uh, command of... Uh, and the buckets, I remember people were standing in buckets firing through these parapets, if you yeah. will, that had been cut. And then the mouse holes in the back uh, of the building that led out to a waiting ambulance. And what you saw, this was made... and. I'm going to do two things. I'm going to answer your question, and then we're going to, I'm going to disrupt the program. Absolutely, briefly. absolutely. Uh, so Andre Leon had made this video. Andre Leon was accompanying the ambulance drivers in Miss Rada, uh, and he'd gone forward with the ambulance driver to that staging area, and then had gone forward from there to the fight, and there was a building of Gaddafi soldiers that was surrounded, and they had surrounded it by, with a series of hard points. The rebels had occupied a number of the buildings near it and chipped these parapets in the wall and cut, um, cut holes through the back of the building so they could come up to these firing positions without exposing themselves. And he went forward as these rebels decided to actually physically assault the Gaddafi building. And he was, he ran forward with them, the assault happened, this Hesh round was fired at much too close, short, much too short a range, and the blast, as the Hesh round struck the wall, sent shrapnel and other things back, which knocked over this, uh, this poor young man who took some shrapnel, I think, in the femoral artery. And then he follows as, now he's doing, he's covering what he came to cover, which was the ambulance driver, so he follows the medevac with his camera on video, and he runs with them through, these, through this chaos you describe, unwittingly making this incredible record of how the battle actually had taken shape on the ground. And so I slowed it down and, and recreated that. And I remember there was something really sad in there because he went back after and there was just a dead child in the building and none of us ever were able to determine who the child was and how he died or how he got there. Uh, and so a lot of times when you're covering tactics and weapons, you're working with other materials just like this, right? I would argue that Andre's reportage was more important than mine. I mean, he was capturing the human story. I went back through and mechanically annotated it. That's all I did. Now I'd like to disrupt the program a little. And if someone will turn a camera, I'm going to ask uh, Al-Hadi Al-Jahan to hold his hand up. <laughs> Do you see him? Stand up, Hadi. So Al-Hadi um, is a Misratan. He's from Libya. And Al-Hadi is also, through a happy coincidence, one of your peers. He's a PhD student here in um, rehabilitation sciences here at the University of Ottawa for two years now. Um, a lot of people and a lot of news organizations 
and a lot of journalists like to think that journalism just sort of happens because journalists are fill in the blank there or savvy or committed or lucky. You can add some pejoratives uh, as well. But nothing, no, I won't say nothing, almost nothing gets done out there in a dangerous foreign place leading to good stories without local help. Local, smart local support, local help opens all of our doors, helps us with our risk assessment, helps us with our day-to-day -day story selection. Al Hadi did that for us. We were in the siege of Misrata in the spring of 2011, and it was Al Hadi each day who was meeting us and taking us around, risking not just his car, but his life, his limb, his social standing, because you know journalists shows up and we're guests at best. Sometimes we're intruders. Sometimes we're intruders accompanying invaders. Uh, it's a dicey, sort of dodgy thing to align with us and help us. And there has not been a story I have done, and I'm using Ahadi, he's going to be embarrassed, but I'm going to use Ahadi not just as Ahadi, but as a stand-in for a whole body of people who make all of our work possible. You know, you see a byline or you see a media institutional name, New York Times, BBC, McLean's, and you think these guys, these people did it themselves. They never, almost never did. Thanks. Thank you. So the, I guess from the, 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 that big anecdote, the two things we can draw are that you can't get anywhere without help from people who actually know the context and know the, know the situation on the ground. In the Andre's case, to make this footage, he had befriended a few ambulance drivers. He was riding with them. No ambulance driver's tolerance of a journalist, that footage doesn't exist. And the other thing that you may be able to get somewhere without the sort of knowledge of, of military doctrine that you have, but it, it, it's sure a huge advantage. A, a, a lot of the stuff you explain in that uh, video would not have needed explaining to another soldier, but it, it, it just looks random to me until, until you do that explaining. Yes, and I'll tell you that I'm going to reject sort of a label that people sometimes have tried to put on my work, you know, classic war correspondence. I think it's bullshit. Actually, I feel pretty limited. There's a lot of stories I almost see that I kind of psych myself out and know I can't do or do well, or that I'm unwilling to jeopardize someone like Al Hadi's social standing to pursue. I'm talking particularly about gender-based stories. You know, war doesn't just happen with men. I end up covering, because often I'm covering male-dominated societies, conflicts in male-dominated societies, combatants who largely are male, like on proportion, like that's skewed way over in the, the 80s, the 90s, sometimes 100% male. And you know how much I'm missing because I do that? I mean, some of the best war journalism I read is written by women who can not just see, but can effectively pursue and under, understand a story that I can't get any access to, like remarriage among war widows in Arab societies. It's a huge story in societies in which the young male population has been decimated. Right? It's a huge story. I can't really do it. I could, I could try. But it would put, if I tried this in Misrata, it would be difficult for El Hadi. I'd be creating tensions that he doesn't need in his life. And I probably wouldn't do the story as well as, as a woman. And often I read stories again and again every day. Some of the freshest stuff I see, I look for the female bylines because a lot of the male bylines are telling me stuff that I already get or understand. And I find a lot of the freshest work goes away from this uh, background I have that sometimes gets celebrated, but I actually find can be pretty damn restrictive. You have the luxury, it's, it's, it is what it is, it's a fact of life. You have the luxury of working at an organization that just has a hell of a lot of resources. Yeah. So you can be a small cog. How many reporters did the Times have in, uh, in Baghdad or in Kabul at the height of those conflicts? Well, early would be bigger than, you know, let's talk there's two. There's the invasion period where you're up in the 
you know, you're in the double digits, right? You're a dozen or more, maybe five or six photographers as well. And then you're in the occupation periods where you go down, but you usually don't go below two or three. And then you get an endless number of people, you know, sort of free agents like me who, who float through. I mean, in the Times, you're right, it's such a rich organization that, you know, they'll send their architecture critic. You know, they'll send their art critic to go look at the museums. You know, he, may, he may only be there two weeks, but he can really do something again that I can't. Like, you know, knowledge of small arms cartridges, it's just not going to help me there. Uh, so I would say we rarely went below two. Yeah. Um, and everyone's strength is a weakness or uh, it's double-sided. I mean, the, the things that we've been talking about allow you to get uh, a very micro level look at a conflict situation, the the uh, a really grain, granular understanding of the action across a few blocks, but these are continent wide theaters, and it's and it's turning into a sort of a third of the world now that is a subject of constant preoccupation for Western governments, from uh, Russia's near abroad to. Uh, ISIS in Iraq and Syria and Lord knows where else to did we get it right in Libya and Afghanistan yeah. are you able to draw like, so what have you learned from these last 15 years of your life what what are there any lessons or as Homer Simpson said is it just a bunch of stuff that happened I've learned first of all <laughs> uh, we need more journalists uh, we need more diversity in journalism um, the chief attribute of doing the job is besides having the basic package of journalism skills, is just justice. I'm sorry, justice, just judgment. We need people with judgment who have a set of journalistic skills. And we need a lot of them. Uh, the things I've learned are sometimes difficult to talk about because they venture pretty sharply into opinion and point of view. And if you do something for a long time, you develop a point of view. I've got many strong points of view. I've become very suspicious of power. Um, I tend to think that the greater the ratio of power that is applied to a problem, even if well-intentioned, the greater the ratio of incompetence. Uh, I'm just not that impressed with it. Uh, I've watched war after war, the development of what I'll call tactical savvy, technical skill. In other words, small unit and individual skills. War is a hell of a teacher, and the people who survive it, many of them tend to learn a few things and get good at it. And institutions that have resources and that are paying attention tend to evolve through the war and become good at the little stuff. But almost all wars that I've seen the institutions and the governments, the movements behind the wars are lousy at the big stuff. Really bad at it, you know? I mean, I can look at Afghanistan and just shake my head. Like, what, what were we thinking as we applied a whole set of well-intentioned but contradictory ideas into this incoherent mess? And then walked away because we were kind of tired, right? I mean, where did coin come from? Counterinsurgency. Yeah, counterinsurgency, right? Like, who invented that? Now, I understand that after the invasions of 2001 and 2003 in um, Afghanistan and then Iraq, that the military recognized it was doing things wrong and needed to do things differently. So they had to come up with something. So they came up with COIN, which is a real, a historic read of the military landscape over the last century, say, or more, and it never could work in hindsight. I think I was a little bit slow to realize that. Uh, you know, they hand out the muffins at the meetings and everybody has a new idea, and they all nod and shake their heads because the fill in the number of stars. The one star says it's a good idea because the three star wrote the doctrine, and so the colonels are on board, and the next thing you know, everybody's doing coin. but. When you read the fine print, it says it takes a quarter century. Well, who's got a quarter century? So what are we going to do at year 10? What are we going to do at year 12? At year 12, are we going to say 12 more years? You can have that conversation in the United States of America? No, you can't. So there's no way it could work on its own timeline. And if you say one of the principles of COIN is that we respect the people and the state institutions 
uh, that we're here to support, then why are we telling them how to run their elections? Isn't that, isn't that very idea of an election mandated by the occupying power at odds with the principles of COIN? Why, why can't they select their own style of government through their own processes? Why do you even have to understand it, right? So I have colleagues, we talked about this when we had a coffee earlier. I have colleagues who say, yeah, okay, war is hell, it's a chaos, it's a big mess, it never works out the way you want, but at the end of it, little girls are able to go to school, you can fly a kite, you can listen to music, you can, uh, sure. you know, you can shave, uh, and, and, uh, and people have basic democratic rights, and, uh, and, and, and in Afghanistan, because narrowing our conversation only to Afghanistan, wasn't it worth all of the other parts of the story? Are those little girls still going to school? Are those little girls who became bigger girls, who became young women, taking a place in Afghan society at any scale proportion to the, in proportion to the effort? Uh, no, I get that it was well-intentioned. And I get that, you know, the Taliban was worse. I'm not, I have no argument with that. I'm just saying that the solution maybe doesn't actually fix the problem. You can make a PowerPoint that says it does. You can hand out the brochure, but it might not be true, and it certainly didn't endure. Um, so I don't, I don't buy that because the idea sounded good, because um, people were committed to it, many good people, that it was necessarily the best idea. Let me flash way back. I mean. You were a soldier uh, in an earlier, much earlier incarnation of this conflict. How does it feel to have just uh, essentially almost no sovereignty over your judgment, your assessment of a situation, to be, uh, uh, to have great latitude in how you carry out an assignment, but the nature of the assignment and, 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 and the utility or futility of the assignment is none of your business. Uh, and. And is being a reporter covering these things any different, or better or worse? So when you're a soldier, you're part of a system. And when you're in a system, you move as units. And units get put where someone puts them. And that's what happens around there is what you come to know and see. When you're a reporter, the whole map is yours. And you assess the whole map and try to figure out with people like Ohadi and with a whole range of sources and streams of information where you should go and you try to go there. And you're able to take in a much greater breadth of things. When you're a soldier, you are assigned a position based on what the organization has in store for you, usually based on age and you know the number of or not so much age, the number of years you've been in the uniform kind of determines what you're eligible to do at that level. When you're a reporter, you can punch at whatever damn weight class you want, right? If I want to get all my information from the privates and the corporals and the captains and the guys out there, the people out beyond on the edges of the system, that's where I'll get all my information from. If I want to go bang my antlers against the antlers of a general, I can do that. I don't have to call him sir. I can just assess him or her based on the merits of their ideas and the strength of their conversation and the strength of the facts before us. When I was in the military, you have to be deferential to this system. And I really like being out and being able to move up and down the ranks and to be able to take the information of a corporal and assign it the same weight as the information from the spokesman of the Ministry of Defense. Uh, it's completely different. It's completely different. It's also sometimes intensely confrontational because people in Western militaries tend to see me and think, hey, you were one of us, you know, you know the prevailing narrative. It's all in your head, like, come on, articulate. And you become having toggled in and out of their world and the world in which they're operating, having toggled between these ranks from top to bottom in their world, you're able to say to yourself, yeah, but what if the damn prevailing narrative's wrong, as it often is? And so it can be difficult. Uh, it can be a fight. Okay. And I'll add one thing. It's also, we tend to knock the militaries a lot, and it's often with good reason, but they are populated by people 
of all different descriptions. And a lot of the people inside the military are just as skeptical about the military as you are or anyone else is. And a lot of them help us. The military organizations are full of ideological insurgents <laughs> uh, and full of whistleblowers. I won't say full, but populated by in, in significant fashion. And they help us a lot. Okay. Current affairs, uh, the, probably the number one foreign policy challenge facing Canada is uh, Syria. Uh, it's become a machine for, 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 for producing uh, refugees. Uh, our ability to accept those refugees is being tested. And it's also become a, a military challenge. And the appropriate response to that military challenge, should we keep or, return or, or remove our CF-18 fighters from the coalition? This is all a matter of debate. Um, do you have any thoughts on how to beat ISIS? How to, how to, how to fix Syria, Afghanistan having gone so well? <laughs> so uh, these are all long view questions, right? Yeah. Uh, let's start with, again, there's no dispute the dimensions and the depths of the problem, right? So arguing against policies is not arguing against the problem. Uh, we often hear, how do we win? Where's victory? I don't think you win. I don't think there is victory. I think you have a long-term public safety, international security problem that's basically hardwired into our world at this stage in our history, and that you try to manage it down as close to zero as you can get. You're never going to get to zero. You're probably not going to get that close to zero. You have to be realistic. Uh, I think I'm going to dodge your question by offering the long-term answer. I don't think there's a fix until it's a Sunni fix. I don't think you can do it with outsiders. I don't think you can do it just with bombs. Uh, I think we should have learned something by now about the development of, call them what you will, local security forces, proxy forces, um, the people who will ultimately settle the question have to be local. It's the only way it's going to stick. You know, a bunch of military units could take Raqqa something like immediately. Uh, the operational hub of ISIS in Syria, right? It'd be a huge, seemingly significant, bright story. You could take it immediately. I mean, it's right over the border. Uh, I mean, uh, with blinding speed. And then what? What do you do on day two? I mean, we've just seen this play in two countries, right? What do you do on day 200, day 2000? Uh, you have to have a local solution. I, uh, I'm a little more hopeful than others, ultimately, on local solutions, because I think there's some lessons that we learned from the local solutions we tried in Afghanistan that we could extract. You know, the, and the Canadians will understand this. The Afghan National Security Forces, the effort to create them, were undermined by the creators, undermined by the conflicts, the incoherent nature of the different organizations making Afghan security forces. I'm going to give you a very specific example. We watched the ANSF, the Afghan Army and Police, rise up, you know, go from tens of thousands into the hundreds of thousands, into the several hundreds of thousands. And we watched it struggle in every way that new military organizations of young men struggle with corruption, with absenteeism, with brutality, with incompetence, tactical incompetence, with administration, every, every way you could measure them. It wasn't working very well. In some places, it was not working at all. And we would hear the perfectly reasonable answer. Give it a few years. We'll develop NCOs. The strength of all military organizations, in an arguable fact, are the enlisted NCOs, the sergeants, the corporals, the senior sergeants. These are the glue that make it work. And when we get the NCOs, these problems will take a downward slope and will come to credible forces that can have an enduring effect upon the country, right? Sounds perfectly reasonable. Write it down. 
Yeah, but what if, however, the CIA and the special forces are taking all of the best soldiers, recruiting them for more money and better stature to come into the Afghan commando units? What if, in other words, as you're growing your NCOs, you have a side door that all of your, not all, but many of your NCOs are using to exit, to go off and do something else? I mean, the way the architecture of this effort was built, it was doomed, right? I mean, you could say, you, yeah, you build this building, it's going to fall down on the first windstorm. You could see it. If that lesson were taken, if we stopped making just specialized units that can have localized effect, and we started to think about how we can have a unit that can have a more permanent effect over a broader area, I think we have a chance. But I'm not confident that we're coherent enough to do that. Each organization, I think, you know, goes to the meeting with its own agenda. You have not been in a combat zone for a while, for more than a year? For Yeah, it's been a while. Yeah. Why not? This was the subject of a, of a, a profile of Chris in the Esquire magazine, but perhaps not everyone reads Esquire these days. So. Well, look at me. I'm an old man, right? <laughs> uh, there's a bunch of reasons. Uh, what's that line they say? You know, all actions are over-motivated, so I had more than one reason. Uh, the principal reason is my family couldn't take it anymore. I mean, I was away a long time, sometimes as long as six months. And even when I wasn't away, people felt like I was about to be. In other words, I was kind of living like a fireman. I had pegs in this little shed that I work in that has an internet connection. And on the pegs, I had you know, a backpack and safety kit, and I kept batteries charged and suites of communications equipment ready. And every now and then the phone would ring or I'd get an email and we'd be planning a trip and I'd be gone. And I wouldn't know often, will I be gone a few weeks, will I be gone a few months? Went on like this for years. And what happens is your children, when they're little and they're playing with Legos, they don't really get it. Bye, Dad, hi, Dad. You know, and if it's two days or two months, it's sort of similar. As they get older and they start reading the paper or they've been around, when the phone calls have come in that your friends have been killed or maimed or, or kidnapped, they start to become informed by, infected with dread, uh, real dread. And then it reaches the point of where even when you don't go, they're expecting you to go, right? They can see a, a spot on the earth is heating up by following the news. And so they think when they go to school, will dad be home when I come back from school? And it reached the point of where on my last trip to Iraq, one of my sons broke out in full body rash. Uh, I mean, complete everywhere except under his chin and around his underwear, uh, hives. And I wasn't gone real, real long, like three weeks, I think, roughly. And when I came home, uh, it went away, like within like 36 hours, basically immediately. Uh, and his doctor told me, you know, this is an autoimmune system miscue caused by stress, caused by, drop the euphemism, you, <laughs> right? Uh, at that point, I also was getting tired. I mean, frankly, let's talk about over-motivation. You can't see there, I'm wearing hearing aids. I should have my glasses in. I mean, I was slowing down anyhow. I, I wasn't learning as much as I had been at the beginning of this journey. I was going out and the stories were starting to feel the same. It wasn't feeling as fresh to me. Um, all of these things sort of aligned with me recognizing it was time to do something else or to try to do it differently, maybe cover the same themes but cover them in a longer form or an investigative fashion and that I didn't necessarily need to continuously shoulder all of this risk and jeopardize my family's well-being. Uh, so about a year ago, I asked to be reassigned. What are you doing now? Long form stuff, mostly. Uh, stories, one story I worked on, it took two years, and I wasn't working on it exclusively for two years, but in bits and pieces between other trips. Uh, I'm working on a few stories like that. I have like five or six things going. Some you may read in two or three weeks. Some you may read in two years. Uh, I have some travel plan, but basically I have um, a portfolio to write longer form investigative stories that take more time to develop 
uh, and I'm doing them for two different sections of the paper, the magazine and the investigative editor. Okay. You must run into people all the time, some of them soldiers, sometimes uh, at universities asking how do I become a highfalutin foreign correspondent like you. Do you have advice? Uh, yeah, there's a lot of different levels of advice, right? The, the first the first thing is just learn your basic journalism skills. You know, you end up out there, Al Hadi can say, can attest to this, asking a lot of the same things you would ask at a traffic accident. You know, right down to how do you spell your name? You know, and how do I get in touch with you later to fact check this on deadline? Uh, what happened? What didn't happen? What did you see firsthand? What did you hear about secondhand? You end up doing the same things in a war that you would do on any story anywhere. So the first thing is to have a basic package of journalism skills. Uh, the second thing I, is to have plaid shirts and black underwear. It's great for stain management. Uh, it's all I wear. Uh, and the third thing is to take your time. You don't, you don't, you don't need to rush at this. You know, I'm in my 50s now. Uh, I started to feel like I was kind of seeing what was going on only about eight or ten years ago, you know? I, I really felt I was hamster wheeling up to that point. And then there comes a point where it sort of starts to make sense. Uh, so go slow. War's not going anywhere. You, you'll catch up to it. It'll always, it'll, always, it'll always be out there. Show up ready. Uh, we're going to open it to questions in a few minutes, so make sure you have questions. If you have any questions in French, don't worry, I want to play the translators. Um, so you're not just Chris Chibbers in the, in, in, in the field or, uh, or, or at home typing. At some level, for some of the people you run into, you are C.G. Chivers of the New York Times, author of The Gun, Big Deal. Uh, is that a help or a hindrance? Hindrance, completely. I don't, I don't like it. Um, that's probably my second piece of advice is, can I swear here? Yeah. Yeah. Fuck the persona. <laughs> you don't need it, you don't want it, it's a burden, right? Like if you go to my Instagram page, uh, there's some work stuff on there, there has to be, it's, it's, it's part of the, the coin of the realm right now. But most of it, you gotta look at my potatoes and the fish I caught and my kids. I want to be a person, you know, it's people do journalism, brands don't do journalism, people do journalism. I want to be in need to be a person, I don't want to have to live up to your expectation of what a war correspondent is, whatever the hell that is. I don't even like the war correspondent label, which I just spoke, because it's a shorthand we all use. I'm a journalist who's covered some war, right? I have a set of journalism skills that I'm trying to continue to grow and I've applied them to war. You know, I could have applied them to the Food and Drug Administration. I could have applied them to the uh, water purity issues in Michigan, um, right? I, I, I don't, I mean, war happened to align with my resume and my background, maybe my inclination. So that's where I spent a chunk of time. But I don't want to be that, that guy for you. I'm, I'm, I'm just me, and I'd, I'd rather be near anonymous I'm required in this strange media climate we live in right now to become a little bit of a brand, but I like the brand to be about the stories and not about me. Okay. On that note, uh, we will take some questions. The, uh, I believe there's a microphone for, at the disposition of uh, people who want to ask questions, and I think I can promise on his behalf that uh, CJ will be very pertinent in his answers if you make sure that your questions are questions. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks. <laughs> Okay, uh, can I start? Please. Uh, I can ask in French, but well, I can as well ask in English, so. As you, as you prefer. All right, um, so I have two questions. Uh, they range more on the opinion based. Uh, it's not factual. Uh, you kind of br brushed over it, uh, but I think it's it's pretty important question. So, um, wait, sorry. Uh, first of all, uh, I wanted to ask you your opinion on uh, the, <laughs> A big curious reporter who can go anywhere you want. I, I'm thinking of a specific example. It's not really in Canada, but in France, where I come from. Um, media goes a lot and a lot faster. Uh, there's Twitter, there's people going on everywhere. So we have, um, in France, there's this guy, uh, 
named Martin Veil, is everywhere. One week is in Burkina Faso, then is in the United States, then in Moscow, and there has been a lot of criticism. I've seen um, people telling, yeah, he's not a real reporter, he doesn't have the understanding, he doesn't have the time. So what are your thoughts on that? Um, do you think a reporter needs to have some real background? Or, because it's popular, right? He goes fast. He's popular. So do you need to be popular fast but not have the broad understanding of the situation? Or to be more professional, to have the background, to have the understanding, to have the local help? Um, so what are your thoughts? What is war reporting so I think for I, I think I know. The, I'll, I'll take a stab at it. I don't think they're mutually exclusive. Um, and I think, and I can think of several people who are performing, I'll stop, I'll drop that word, trapped in that role and its trappings. Often it's because their network uh, is built that way. It's, 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 it's the, the, the physical structure, the line diagram of the job has someone who has to be the brand and has to be the face and they while they sometimes work exclusively, they often are there quickly reading up on the wire and the local news and doing stand-ups or going down very briefly to an area uh, and delivering quick summaries with a vignette or two, right? That's, that's what they often have to accomplish. Many of them are much more capable than that and often do when they do longer programs, you know, solid investigative work. If that's the mechanism that their network or magazine or newspaper creates for them, then so be it. It still has a value, right? There's people, I think, who go to that, understand they're not getting in-depth. And then you need it to be complemented by the specialists that you just described. I would say on balance, the specialists are ultimately more important and more essential. And the parachutists are often living on and, and kind of compressing uh, much of the specialists work but I don't think they're mutually exclusive and I would have trouble criticizing it frontally because it's better than silence right it's better parachute someone into Burkina Faso than give me more coverage of sports or more coverage of the entertainment industry so I'll, I'll take it understanding it can't be my whole diet yeah, because um, on the, the particular case I'm thinking about, it's really popular among the youth in particular because the, 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 the guy is likable. He's a Tintin kind of guy, you know? He's, he's everywhere and he's really likable. He's got his small face, but then he goes in. He goes in depth, like he, he talks to locals. He So good, engaging, yeah. Yeah, engaging with issues. How can, how, can I, how can I criticize it? We could say I'd, I'd like more, I'd like more sophistication and depth, but I, I can't knock it. Uh, a quick second question. Yeah. Okay. Well, sure. Um, so uh, to go back to 9/11, you talked about how um, you stayed on for a long time. My question is on follow-up uh, because I'm a student journalist in in an independent. Uh, student journalist. So we have kind of more time than institutions that are pressured by. Um, economics reason. So what's the importance of follow-up? I'm thinking of this because of John Stewart, of what he's doing right now with the first responders in the United States and the law um, for their, their health system, their health uh, help, which is a follow-up on a really big story like uh, 15 years later. So what's your thought on follow-ups? Uh, what is the importance? What should be given to that? Um, thought? So follow-up is, is just part of the B. I wouldn't even call it follow-up. What you're talking about is beat reporting. Mm -hmm. Staying on a beat, follow-up's an element of it. You, you know, you, as long as the follow-up has something to say. What I, what I don't like is it's 25 years since this happened, so now we're going to force you to revisit it, right? It's mm -hmm. 10 years since this happened. Anniversary stories drive me up the wall, right? If, you, if there's something to say and someone can go out there and channel that journalistically, then let's do it. I was just wondering if you could just speak to um, how, how you read the news, how you follow the news, what your sources are, do you read Twitter, how do you analyze news and, and, and approach news when uh, you know, you're sitting in, in your shed and following stories? So like, uh, I'll tell you what I don't do, I don't watch much TV. I grew up without one and haven't owned one. Uh, 
which in this day and age doesn't mean you don't get TV journalism, because it's online too. But I don't have, I'm not one of those people who has a TV going and the ribbon and, and the 24 hour news uh, is not coming at me that in that medium. Uh, I'd say I'm as overwhelmed as everyone in the room and I'm constantly shifting my choices and what I look at. I look not so much for brands in the news organization sense, you know, BBC versus Al Jazeera versus Washington Post. I look at specific writers and specific beats. I read writers and beats and lines of knowledge, lines of information, uh, which sometimes includes, you know, blogs. Uh, I also have to say that I'm not an editor. I'm not a commentator across a, a broad portfolio of issues. I don't have to know everything. I spend a fair amount of time ignoring the conversation of the moment completely. And in like a tunnel, like a submarine. Imagine a submarine that goes down and has no radio communications for the depth of its dive, the length, the duration of its dive. Maybe my dive will be a few days. You know, Paul tweeted something about the event. I didn't see it for a little while, a couple of days, a few days, five days. I, I don't remember what it was. It was a little while. I'll work on something. I mean, I'm lucky. I'm detached from the day-to-day -day news. Um, and I, w I might not pay attention for a little while. Now, I still have email going. And I'm often, most not every day, but several times a week, queried by a peer who has a question about something that falls in my body of knowledge. So I'll then toggle back to a running story and contribute in my particular way an analysis of the bombs used in Paris. I did that last week. Uh, for example, I'll get pulled back into it like that. But to answer, your, to go back to your question, I, I, I struggle with that. I do not read particular brands. I read particular people and particular beats. Do you get called to be a talking head? Like, does Wolf Blitzer's producers call you and, and say, will you come and comment on this latest atrocity or whatever? I get called a lot, and I, d I don't often answer. And so some of the more prominent places stopped calling because they know that I, I usually I won't do it. You can spend a lot of time talking, and it interferes with work. <laughs> yeah. Next. You were talking earlier about the importance of local fixers like uh, El Hadi. Uh, so I'm just wondering, is it hard to find local people who are willing to risk their their life or their or their standing in the community to work with uh, some foreign correspondent who they might not even? Yeah. So every uh, every circumstance is different. Sometimes it's really hard. Sometimes it's not so hard. It's hard to find good people, um, and we. I, I want to be careful because a lot of people don't work out, and so I don't want, and, and we've had people who cannot handle the various pressures. Uh, I usually think they're the saner ones among us. <laughs> uh, we've had people, you know, panic. Uh, panic's dangerous. Uh, panic's not welcome, and we've had to let people go. And we've had other people who have come and stayed for years and years. Uh, and every circumstance is different. Sometimes, wow, it was like literally one of the first people I met. And sometimes it's the 15th person who we had hired. So yeah, it can, be, it, can be, it can be pretty hard. You know, ask yourself, would you do it? Right? You fit the pro, are you a student here? No, I'm just interested. All right, well, there's students here. Ask yourself if you do it. The students often meet the profile. Many of the students are multilingual, widely read, already engaged with the news outside of their country, and they often flock to us when we show up. Would you do it? Would I do it in my town? You know, here's a quick story. Like, why do people trust us at all in their midst? I puzzle over that sometimes. Even at the like much saner precincts that I work in, I'm always astonished when someone answers a question. Not because we're duplicitous or cunning, but like they got other things going on. Who's got time for this? And you know, Hadi and I were working. Uh, Hadi had lived in Russia. He was 
he had good English, but not the English he wanted, not at the level he wanted. I was working with Brian Denton, a photographer, who we would have trouble fitting in this room, he's so big, uh, who speaks Arabic, but not to the level he wanted to. It gets better each year. He's really good, but five years ago it wasn't where it is now. Um, I speak Russian, not real well, but functionally. Uh, Hadi had lived in Russia, he spoke Russian. There would be moments out there where we're using all these languages to figure something out, you know? And there was this moment where we were at a school, and the way the world is organized, schools are always, it seems, become battlefield centers. The school shuts down when a country goes to war, and these are public buildings, so there doesn't feel like you're, the, the, the people who occupy them don't feel like they're necessarily confiscating private property. So they naturally, in their community centers, they tend to be well located on good roads. So we were around some school uh, short of the airfield, the airport at Misrata, from which the Qaddafi forces were shelling, firing rockets into Misrata terribly for weeks and weeks and weeks. And this one commander had a school up near there. Um, and we would visit the commander often, sometimes a couple times a day, almost certainly every day. We'd make our way around the city each day, and this was one of the stops. And he'd been pretty good to us. And Hadi was trying to explain something. We were struggling with the word, so he looked at me and said it in Russian. And the commander was like, the reporter speaks Russian? <laughs> right? He was really suspicious. <laughs> right? And we were talking about, Hadi and I had dinner last night, we were talking about this commander who was, I think, on balance, a good guy and had, I had a very good discussion with him as the airfield finally fell and the forces, the uh, Qaddafi attacking forces were driven off um, about the perils of Libya and how scared he was for the future of Libya because everyone had a gun now and he turned out, of course, to be right. It wasn't a hard observation to have, but not many people were having it then, because it, it went against the sense of euphoria. So I was, I was impressed with him, and uh, we were talking about it last night. If I'm having a, a war in my town, all right, and some reporter shows up with some local kid from the university, which I don't really know. The university's not far from my town, but I, I don't know the students over there. And these guys show up you know, in their $3,000 car and they all barrel out with all their equipment strapped all over them and their antennas sticking everywhere and start talking to me and they stick around for a few weeks and then they start talking Russian? <laughs> I might have a problem with that, <laughs> right? I mean, just naturally, I'm going to wonder, like, w w what's going on here? The hospitality of the people who host us, considering who we are and what we look like and how we act, is just extraordinary. Absolutely extraordinary. And finding people who can navigate that kind of moment with us is not easy. I think sometimes of Robert Caro, the, the, the great biographer of Lyndon Johnson, who's just come out with his fourth volume of a 7,000-page biography of Johnson. He's now racing to finish it before he dies. He'll have spent a day covering Johnson for every two days that Johnson was alive. <laughs> and the first, the first five years of the project, he wasn't getting anywhere with the people from West Texas where Johnson grew up. And finally, he told his wife, we're going to have to move there. Because it's, at some level, people won't talk to you if you're not their neighbor. And, uh, and like we, it's, that's comically far from what most of us can do in our lives. You've you got to go and knock on the door. You've never heard of me. Uh, tell me what, your position on this conflict that's killing people around you. It's a, it's a hell of a trick to, <laughs> to make it work. Uh, next question, please. Uh, your opinion. Looking at the world today, are there issues that you wish the media would pay more attention to and are not? Uh, I'm going to dodge your question. How about hearing protection? <laughs> <laughs> no, seriously, I wanted to do this because I knew I had your audience. These things are great. See them? Wish I wore them. You know? Got hearing aids last week. It's psychedelic to hear again after not hearing for a few decades. You know? What would I like to see covered more? Uh, this is a serious answer. It's not going to satisfy you. Uh, evolutionary biology. I'm really interested in science and wish I could cover that and hadn't been so typecast that everything's about guns and blood. Uh, I eat that stuff up. Uh, 
And the other thing I think would be income inequality. When I said the world's hardwired for what we have, that's a significant part of the reason. Income inequality. Best beat that's unassigned in the world, probably. Offshore banking. Give me a bunch of people who really can get inside Caribbean banking, the banking in the Gulf, banking in the Far East. Uh, you'll start to see a web of things that we don't even sniff at yet. Have you, suge have you suggested that up the line? No, I'm the crank that people don't really listen to. I, 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 I may have suggested it at one point or another, but I, I suspect I'm reasonably well tuned out by now. <laughs> uh, next question. Well, thank you for coming here to talk to us today. Thank you. The people in the room definitely learned a thing or two about good, good journalism today. Uh, I'm an, I am a currently a student journalist and hopefully an aspiring um, international correspondent. And my, my question for you would be, were there some points in your career when you were, uh, say, covering in Afghanistan where you thought to yourself, what the hell am I doing here? Why do I keep putting myself into these type of situation? And if so, what motivated you to, to stay and keep doing your work? I never hit that point. And my struggle now is not going back. No, I never hit that point. I, uh, I'm not wired really to sit at a desk or in a cubicle. So in some ways, these awful events that I had to cover were really personally escapist. And they allowed me to go have a lifestyle that let me stay in this profession. Because if I had to go into a cubicle every day, I probably wouldn't have made it. Uh, I also believed, and most days still do, that it mattered. That these are huge human enterprises and that if we can snatch some stories out of them so they can be understood, that it's worth it, right? And combatants are often stereotyped, I think, badly, including by me. We're all, we're all guilty of it. And I wanted, you know, going to war is a human activity. It's never going to, we're never going to be a race that doesn't war. And I wanted to try to understand what makes people take up arms to solve problems and what's that like for them over time. And so I, 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 I can't think of a day where I said, you know, should I be here? No. What's a, a paraphrase of that question? What's your relationship to danger, to the feeling of being personally in danger? A lot of people think that. Um, war correspondents crave that. Um, the, on my very limited trips into those kinds of situations, one of the things that strikes me is uh, people are actually working uh, all the time at being as safe as they can in these situations. Um, where, where are you yeah, on that? So that's a, it's a hard question to answer. We probably would need like you know 50 minutes on a couch just to get started. Uh, <laughs> Doing it for a long time and doing it well, you have to shut yourself off. Bit by bit, you shut yourself down. You become an observational instrument with equipment that you need to keep ready, that's observing things for you. Harvesting information, sound, images, notes. To do that, you have to shut yourself down, and you come to pride yourself in how much you've shut yourself down. Um, I've been slowly trying to switch myself back on. It's pretty weird uh, and very uncomfortable. There's a lot to unpack. That's just to navigate the sensory overload and the prospects of danger. Then there's real danger, which is different. Uh, we're human, so we react to it differently in different times. I have been intensely afraid in situations that maybe didn't merit the amount of fear that was coursing through me that you couldn't see because I wouldn't show it to you. Uh, I've been completely exhilarated in horrible situations, 
fast-moving, rapid, ordinance-based violence. I've been in these situations where it's like all going out in slow motion. Like it's, you can feel it happening in slow motion and you can make predictive assessments of what's gonna happen next and sometimes they're even right. Uh, I've been locked up at the computer bawling alone, writing stories after, not knowing what the hell's going on with me. And each time when something really nasty happened, when up to a few years ago, I would say, go back out the next day. Don't let it catch you. Like, don't let it get you psychologically, because if you don't go back out, you won't be able to go out later. Don't think about it. Um, all of these things are in conflict with each other, right? They're not, it's not consistent. Um, I came to, with time, think the best problem was the one you avoided. Easiest problem to solve is the one you don't have. And my risk assessment got more and more intense and layered. And I have peers, I'm not gonna name them, one in particular, a very, very close friend who tends to think that the journalism needs to be spectacular, but it's only as good as the difficulty it was to get. So if you, like, rode your motorcycle off the cliff, parachuted onto the moving vehicle 3,000 feet below, uh, ran across the minefield, interviewed the guy who tried to kill you before the end of the interview, crawled your way back across a river under fire with the bullets popping in the water around you and found your way to a laptop and filed. No, the story's okay now, <laughs> right? That's a, that, that one, that story was worth it. He's talking about me, guys. <laughs> <laughs> and and I, I began to argue with this guy. I mean, we're really close and there was like a point at which we were working together and we'd just been in a, a pretty nasty firefight and someone had been shot and we were trying to, we had a lot of material we were trying to process and it was gonna take, frankly, a couple of days to process it and turn it into something to say. And we watched another patrol go out and it was uh, a fire team patrol, four people plus like three Afghans plus a translator, seven people. I used to train for gunfight. I'm like, seven people is nothing. One machine gun burst, you get a couple of these guys down, they're immediately overwhelmed. Seven people patrolling in Afghanistan, I thought, was madness, right? It's just not enough. You, you should have a firm dozen, minimum, to be able to handle an incident, to handle an IED. And he was looking at this patrol longingly. There was another patrol out. It was like a few fields away, and there was a Cobra gunship shooting into the tree line, and all this stuff was going on. And he was standing there mesmerized. He's like, we need to go on one of those patrols. And I'm like, we just walked off a patrol. We've got this rich set of material here. We need to get this out. I said, I, how am I going to justify zipping you up in a body bag tomorrow for that? We, don't even, we haven't even told the story that's in our notes, right? Like, it's not danger for the sake of danger. But there's, I guess I began to think small. And I said, my job each day that I'm writing is to tell a story that's useful for someone to hear. Some people think, I have to tell the most important war story ever. If the second happens in the pursuit of the first, I'll take it. But I began to think kind of small, you know, incrementally, chip by chip. So <laughs> that's a long answer to you, what's the relationship to danger? I'd say it was always evolving. I never quite got it right. But the value is, so if someone's sitting back at headquarters and they're only talking about uh, the, the, the theater-wide strategic picture, then it's, it, at some level it's a fiction. So when you tell the story of com conflict among, with, with six guys on the side that you're covering across a block and a half of space, what you're conveying is the actual complexity of that whole theater. You multiply the story you just told, which is a tiny little corner of the story, across you know, thousands of square kilometers, you start to get a sense of, uh, of, of, of how complex a thing really is. I think that's the value of the work that you As long as we're careful with our extrapolation, because each thing can be particular. But yeah, the, the small scale has value in the large discourse. There's no question about it. 
trying to find the balance between, you know, we're all trying to find it. I don't know if we ever get it right. And the other thing is when you go out, you don't know what you're going to get. I remember I was out with Joao Silva, and a guy we were with was shot by a sniper. And we went out the next day, and another guy we were with was shot by a sniper. And there was a process of notification before the service members' families were notified, and then we wrote about it. Uh, I think we wrote two separate stories. One of these sets of pictures uh, was frankly extraordinary, right? I mean, a, a, a Marine had been shot through, I'm going to say, the right arm, the right lat, the right lung. Uh, it hit the back of his flak jacket and the sappy plate, and I think it ricocheted, went and nicked his spine, entered the left lung. Uh, and he collapsed. Uh, and a sergeant went forward and rescued him. Walked right out into the open, big diesel guy, rolled him over, grabbed him by the drag strap, which by then, remember I said how militaries evolved, the flak jackets had drag straps on, dragged him and sort of heaved him behind a row of reeds and got out a first aid kit and a knife and cut away all of his equipment and bandaged him while someone took a knee next to him with a radio and called for the quick reaction force which came and drove him away, picked him up and drove him away, all still watched over by the sniper in this very small, hot space in the course of minutes, a run of minutes, 15, I, I don't know, 5, 30, it's lost to me now, but not many. And uh, the pictures went out. You can imagine these pictures. They're extraordinary. It was just a picture of one man saving another's life. In fact, the Marine Corps took the photographs, stapled them together, and made them a Bronze Star submission for the sergeant. Uh, the pictures went out, the story went up, uh, and we started to get criticized. Oh, the New York Times suppresses these photos all the time. Why don't we see story, photos like this every day? And you're like, because, man, the photos don't exist every day. We're not suppressing photos. You know how hard and rare it is to get photos like this and what it takes to get photos like this? You know, so I look back at, 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 at some of these things and think that the idea that, you know, the journalists are manipulating the conversation uh, is kind of ridiculous in some levels for what I do. Because you go out there, you don't know what's going to happen. This may happen. Or you may drink tea with villagers for a month and nothing happens. You, you, you just simply do not know what your story will be and what you'll be extrapolating from. Okay. Uh, I see more people at the microphone. I am afraid we're going to have to leave you wanting more. And I'm conscious, if it's any consolation, that I exercise moderator's privilege and asked him way more questions even after I was supposed to be letting you ask questions. I am sorry. Um, uh, Chris Chivers, thank you very much for taking the time and coming and uh, sharing your stories of what it's like to tell these, uh, these stories and go to these places and cover these situations. And we hope to see you again soon. Thanks thank very much. Thank you for having me. Is thank uh, Chris. I think uh, I, for me to thank you, Paul. We wanted a conversation. We wanted to feel like we were in uh, Chris Chivers' uh, uh, hut in the back with you, uh, where you would speak frankly and honestly about your experiences. And I think we've we've definitely had that today. So uh, thanks to both of you and to Paul for so skillfully pulling out the story. Thanks again.